morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, well, welcome to our final day of the team lectures. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming each day and um, giving your kind attention to Jacob. Uh, today is going to be speaking about relationships to close out the week, which is an important topic for young people. And so um, I invite you to uh, give him your attention and listen uh, intently one more time. And let's welcome Jacob. All right, guys, it is our last day, and so we have a lot to do. This is a, an interesting, and hopefully I want to hear from you guys, especially adults in the room. I don't really want to hear from you. I want to hear from the younger people, but uh, I want to hear from you about some of the things that we're going to talk about. I think you'll find, at the very least, interesting, maybe challenging, uh, because we're going to talk about relationships, and that has some different phases. We kind of lumped them all together. We're going to talk about friends. And we're going to talk about media, and we're going to talk about dating, and probably a little bit about sex. Okay, so that's our goal. That's our overview. Uh, remind you, we're talking about a faith that lasts, and our goal is to build a faith that lasts. We talked about this. 40 to 50% of kids who are raised going to church will abandon their faith as they approach adulthood. And the question is, will that happen to me? Is that going to be me? And we want to talk about how we can avoid that. Particularly, I, I, this is just going over what we've covered already. Uh, the main goal that I want you to see that we're focused on in this session is the idea of taking ownership of our faith. I want you to know that you will leave this room and it will not matter what I told you to do or not do. What will matter will be what you choose to do in the future. These are decisions you will make. And you can sit here and say, I know when I was your age, I got really resentful of people telling me what to do. I did not like it. And I did not like it in this forum. I did not like it when people were using the Bible and they were saying, don't do this. But there was a point at which I had to realize I had decisions to make whether they agreed with them or not. It was my life and my decisions were going to affect me no matter what other people thought of them. And that's true for you too. Uh, there'll be times where you and I won't be together anymore and you'll go live your life and you'll make decisions about these things. It won't matter what I think, but it will matter to you what you do. So I want you to think about taking ownership. My faith, my life, it matters what decisions I make, whether or not I'm going to remain close to Jesus, or if you just want to say it this way, whether I'm going to make a mess of my life. That's your choice, but I want you to think about some things that God has to say about your life. That's our goal today. Uh, so we talked about these four basic categories of why people fall away. We talked on uh, Tuesday about the gospel. We talked yesterday about identity, who I am and what my gifts are, so that I know that I am a child of God and I know that I have a purpose and that God has given me special things that I can use for him and to serve other people. Uh, we're not going to talk about issues with God this week. Instead, today we're going to focus on relationships and uh, the idea that relationships affect whether or not we stay faithful to Jesus. All right. So let's talk first about friends. Uh, why are friends good? How can friends help us? Yeah. They can offer encouragement. Yeah. Yeah. So someone's going to pump you up, keep you going. You're doing great. Yeah. Advice. Advice. Iron sharpens iron. We're going to talk about that one in just a second. Yeah. Advice, encouragement, uh, making us better. When do you guys have your hand? They cover it. All right. They can make us smile. They can make us smile. Make us smile. Sure. Make you feel better. Entertainment. Entertainment? Yeah. Some <laughs> some friends entertain you, right? Maybe by the things, the dumb things they do. Yeah. Love and support. Love and support. Love and support. Okay. Yeah. This is what I always say about two Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Keep us from being alone. Yeah. So we, we're not alone, we have friends, we, we feel comfortable, we feel like we belong. Well, they help keep us in line, they know what our problems are, and if you're trying to search the words for them, they can say, I know you're trying to search the words, but right. why don't we go do this instead? Right. Some friends will call you out, right? In fact, I think that's one of, the, one of the good signs of a friend is you're doing something dumb, and they're like, hey, quit doing something dumb. Why are you doing that? And in fact, I, I don't know that I am that close to a friend if they see me doing something that I, they know I shouldn't or that they know I uh, would be a dumb thing to do and they don't say anything or even they go along and do it with me. That's not really a great friend, right? But friends help us in all of those ways, okay? How can friends hurt us? Yeah. They can hurt us with disagreement. 
Ja? Okay. Leads away from God. Uh huh. Ja? Peer pressure in a bad way, right? So they can help us if they peer pressure us toward good things. They can hurt us if they pressure us toward bad things. Okay? What else? Yeah? Abandon us. Abandon us. Okay. So you have a good friend. Uh, what do we say now? They, they ghosted you. You know, like, we're not talking anymore. I don't know why. Okay? That hurts. What? What else? Yeah? Betray your trust. Okay, sometimes they'll let you down and they'll stab you in the back, we sometimes say. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good. Spread false information. Uh huh. Introduce you to wrong stuff. Okay. Hey, why don't you try this? Why don't you come with me and do this? And then, like, that kind of all compounds together, right? Like, you're in this situation, you feel the pressure, you're introduced to something new, it's with people you care about. And suddenly you find yourself doing and saying things you would never do. Haven't you had that experience? Have you ever had the experience that you look up and you're doing something and you say, why am I doing this? Or you say, I can't believe I did this. Almost always the answer of why you did it has to do with friends, has to do with those pressures. So I want you to see it's not that friends are bad and it's not that friends are good. It's that they are a reality and we have to think about which direction are they leading me. Hurting, helping, good, bad, because both of those are always possible. Um, I'll tell you, uh, I've done a lot of work in prisons. And when you talk to people in prisons, it, it is an amazing thing. Because most people that you meet in a prison seem like nice people, good people. And you say, well, what happened? How did you end up here? And the stories are all the same. Every single story is the same. Can you believe this? Every person winds up in prison the same way. If you talk to them, they will say, I started running with the wrong crowd. Every story. I couldn't believe it. It was like they were all reading the same script. I started running with the wrong crowd. And that led to this, and that led to this, and then I did this, and now here I am. And sometimes they'll say, and then I got out, and then I started running with my old friends again, and now I'm back. It was amazing to me. And it really, to me, underscored these are not decisions you make in a vacuum. The decisions you make that affect your life are going to be made in a group with other people. So the question becomes, who am I going to pick to be in my group and to have an influence on me? Okay. Does what we listen to, so now we're talking a little about media, does what we listen to, watch, and read matter? And give me an answer, why or why not? So does it matter? Just say yes or no, and then say, tell me why. Yep. Yeah, it sparks interest in something, right? Okay. If I read something or I watch something, suddenly I'm interested in that thing. Might be a good thing, might be a bad thing, but one way or another, it's going to kind of put me down a path, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and maybe it's not, oh, I'll now curse. It's instead it just kind of becomes a part of your thinking and your vocabulary, and you think, oh, that's what people say because that's what I've been hearing, what I've been thinking about. Yeah, others? Well, I would say yes also because similar to that, it's like what you put into you is what comes out of you. It's like if you put a tennis ball in a tennis ball game, guess what? It's got to shoot out the other side. Right, right. Um, I saw this, so, so I have three kids. Uh, you see this really, really bad when you have young children that no matter what you say, you start hearing your kids say it. Okay? And my kids would start to, to talk like me, and sometimes they would say things, and I would think, I didn't realize that I was saying that that much, but they did, and they heard it. Why do they talk that way? It's because that's what they've heard. So it's the same principle, right? Whatever we hear becomes what we say. Whatever we watch becomes what we think about. It always has an impact on some level. Yeah.
Yeah, it kind of feeds that desire, right? Whatever the desire is, good or bad, what we, it just kind of feeds the flame. So if it's a bad thing and I watch people do it or talk about it or I'm thinking about it more, I mean, this is just common sense, right? If I watch people do something I'm struggling with or worried about or thinking about, it's going to push me a little bit in that direction. So I want you to think about that, that what we listen to, watch, and read matters And it matters because, not because that in itself is the biggest problem in the world, but because your mind is a place where all your decisions are going to come from. And then what you feed your mind contributes to what those decisions become. So if you're always thinking about uh, awful things, and then you're always reading about them, watching about them, looking at them online, or listening to people talk about them all the time, your mind is not neutral then. Your mind becomes a place where you're more likely to at least think those things are okay, maybe even to do them. And that's the concern. The concern is, how does that affect me? And then what comes next? So I want you guys to think about, you have to take ownership for this. I'm not responsible for your mind, but you are. And when you feed your mind with evil things or with evil influences... Don't be surprised when you start becoming evil. That's just common sense. So I want you to think about this. We're going to talk about uh, some passages from Scripture here. This is Proverbs 13 and verse 20. It says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Okay, now, a couple of things. First, if you walk with the wise, you become wise. You, you walk around with people who have a certain attitude and spirit. They're wise people. It's going to rub off on you. You're going to become like them. I think it's a principle that you kind of become like whoever you're around. And if you're around people that are wiser than you, they kind of pull you up so that you become wise. But the other interesting part of this verse is it says the companion of fools. What do you expect? If whoever walks with a wise becomes wise, then the companion of fools becomes a fool, right? That's what you think. But that's not what it says. It says the companion of fools will suffer harm. In other words, you hang around with fools and they're going to hurt you because they're fools. That's what they do. So which choice should you make? The proverb says, find some people who are going to make you better, not people who are going to make you worse. Uh, Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Find people who will love you and do good to you even in times of struggle and adversity and you'll find someone who's not just a friend but a brother, someone that is close and connected that you have a relationship and a bond that is going to go through difficult times. Somebody talked about betrayal or talked about dropping you as a friend and the pain that that causes. Here we're reading about people who are not going to do that to us, who are committed to us and loyal to us, who will say things to us that we need to hear, but also be there for us when we're in low places. A brother is born for adversity. Somebody mentioned this verse, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. That we are here to make each other better, but there are people in the world who will make you worse. So we don't want to be the kind of person who is made worse by our companions. We want to be the kind of person who other people make us stronger, closer to God, better people, and we want to make them better. This is what relationships are for. But if we just go by, you know, I'm just going to be around the people that I like or that tell funny jokes, then what we end up having is not this. It's not something that makes us better. It's instead something that makes us worse. And then do not be deceived. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Bad company ruins good morals. Do not be deceived. Why do you think it says do not be deceived? What does that imply? Yeah. It implies, yeah, that, that I might not see it. I might think they're good. I might think, or I might even think, that, yeah, they may be bad, but I'll pull them up. You know, I'll make them better. I'll influence them. And he says, don't be deceived. Don't think that this won't happen to you. I will tell you, I've had bad friends before, and I thought, you know what? I know what 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, but 
I know better than that. Like, that's not going to happen to me. Not with this guy. No, this will be different. See, I'm better than that. And I think that's part of the deception he's warning about. Don't be deceived. Don't think that you're somehow immune to the basic principle of life that people who are evil are going to have an impact if they're close to you. All right. Uh, this is Romans 12, 1 to 2. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I want to focus on this idea of don't be conformed to this world, which means don't be like the world. Don't be what the world is forcing you into its mold to become. Instead, be transformed, be changed by the renewal of your mind. Your mind is the place from which your whole life will emanate. The Bible calls it the heart. And this is the place where decisions are made, where friends have an impact, where information flows in and actions and words flow out. And Paul is saying, don't be like the world. Don't let the world define you. Instead, you be transformed by having your mind renewed, refreshed by God speaking to you, you listening to God and becoming more and more what God calls you to be. So if this is a verse that talks about renewing your mind, I want you to think about what that might mean for how you use your phone or what you watch when you watch YouTube and TikTok and all of this. What's that doing to your mind? Is that making you more like the world or is it transforming you by renewing your mind more like God? And don't think that those things don't have an impact. They obviously do. The question is, how are we going to work on that? How are we going to manage that? But this is God's will. God's will is that your mind be renewed and not like the world. Uh, I want you to see this, that the, the way your mind is can become a dark place. Some of you may have lived through this. Some of you may be in this place right now. But I want you to see these words because they are strong words. This is Ephesians 4, 17 to 19. He says, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Their minds are useless. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. I mean, that's some strong language. He's saying your mind can become a place where it's dark and hard, where nobody can tell you anything. You don't want to listen to anyone. You just want to do your own dark things. You've given yourself over to sensuality. You just want to do what you want to do. No one can tell you anything. It's a dark place. You don't want to get here. But the question kind of is, how do we get there? And I believe the answer is at least in part because we're having things spread into our minds that are hardening us and making our thinking futile or worthless. All right, I got one more passage I want to read. And it's a long one. You can see all these words. Uh, I want to warn you about that. But I'll just read through it and, uh, and we'll be through it in just a second. This is, uh, for some, this is probably a familiar text. It talks about King Solomon. It says, now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, and on the, mount, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. All right, now that's a lot of women. It's a lot of marriages. I know that's kind of crazy. I want you to see the point. The author even says, hey, God told Solomon, don't marry these people. 
because they will turn away your heart after other gods. And so Solomon decided, I'm going to marry a whole bunch of them. And what happened? It turned away his heart. And so now, I want you to think about what it would be like to be Solomon. So you're married to a whole bunch of women. And here comes wife number, oh, I don't know, 38. And she says, honey, I really want to worship my God. I mean, your God has his temple. And, you know, so-and-so over here, you built her a temple for her God. What about my God? And what does he say? That seems fair. We'll build a temple to your God. So temple after temple after temple. And then she says, honey, I really want you to come worship with me. Why do we have to worship apart? We're married. Why can't we worship the same God? I'll go to your God's temple if you come to my God's temple. So off he goes. And time after time he does it. You see how many different temples he builds. And it says Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. Why? Because he married a Sidonian woman. That's why. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Why? Because he married an Ammonite woman. That's why he did it. So what you see is not that Solomon was studying about all these gods and he read all their books, their Bibles, and said, you know what, I just think this is the best God. Solomon did it because of the women. He did it for people. Do you think that can happen today? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. We're talking about relationships. What we're talking about really is influence. And how people influence us. And they can influence us toward God or away from God. But the choice is really ours. Which influences are we going to put in our lives? Which ones? And how are we going to manage the influences in our lives? Okay. So uh, let me skip the first question here. Let me just do this one. Do you think that having bad friends or filling our minds with bad things can contribute to us moving away from Jesus? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just seems more like a good idea because I'm around people that do it. Sometimes we're that way. If we've never heard of anybody doing that or thinking that way, it sounds crazy to us. But the minute we have close people to us saying or doing it, we're a lot more open to it. Yeah. It's, it, it gets nervous when you have to say it in front of everybody. It's cool. If you, if you remember, raise your hand again. All right, what else? So I'm, I'm really asking, oh, did, you, did you come back? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so Jesus warns us, don't, don't be like this. Don't think this way. Don't do these things. So that pushes us away. Yeah. And uh, it gets a lot easier is what he's saying for those in the back. It gets easier if you go down that path a little bit, then the next step and the next step are easier and easier to take. That reminds me of this passage that we read uh, where it talks about them becoming callous. You know what callous is? That, uh, and you guys play guitar. Yeah, you get the calluses on your fingers. You, don't, you can poke your finger and you stab it with a needle when you have the calluses. And it doesn't hurt because you've worn out the feeling on the end of your fingers with the guitar strings. That's what happens. You can make your whole heart and thoughts get callous so that you don't care anymore. Like, you know what? Whatever. This is what I do. I'll keep going because I, I no longer have the same feeling that I did. All right, somebody else? Yeah. I can say a few things with the friend of the angel. I can say, for example, your friend that you can introduce to the church, and then, like, you can still find her. It's not that big a deal. Like, keep talking and talking. 
Yeah. So you've got, here's the, hey, let's just not go. And then you've got, but, but it's okay. It's not that big a deal. And you're kind of minimizing the problem. And the, so the people are where you might not be that way on your own. Now they're kind of leading you and leading you. And suddenly you find, I'm not even interested in that anymore. Yeah. Right. This is not that big a deal. And then the line keeps moving as you keep changing. Yeah. And you get the self-justification, which then sort of the scales fall off and you realize, wow, I'm further than I thought I would be. Yep. Yeah, so line keeps moving. There are better choices that we need to be making. And yet, you know, with the wrong inputs, we're going the wrong direction. So I want you to think about this. This happens to people every day. There is no reason it won't happen to you. None. If you choose this path, this is where the path leads. And so there's not like an exception because, you know, I know you guys are all super smart. I know you're just awesome people very attractive people, great futures ahead of you. It doesn't change that this can happen to you, okay? If you choose the path, you get to the end of the path. Um, Okay, Uh, let me ask you a question. I wanna ask a couple of these questions. One is about friends and one is about media. I wanna be a a little more practical, thoughtful here. Sometimes what we've talked about so far kind of comes across as, all right, guys, get rid of all your worldly friends and only have Christian friends or people who are interested in doing the right thing. Or you hear, you know, you talk about media and it's like, don't listen to bad things or look at bad things online or whatever. Um, And that's all you hear is you hear all good, no bad. Uh, But that's really not very practical, is it? Because... Like, pretty much all media is going to have something kind of bad in it. And pretty much all people, like, people don't walk around with, I'm a good friend over their head or, like, a name tag that says, I'm a good friend. Like, most people are pretty good and kind of bad in some ways. So my question is, how do you think a Christian should manage his or her friends? And especially, is it okay to have worldly friends? Is that okay? And if so, how do you avoid what we've talked about? Worldly people making me worldly. Yep. Go ahead. Okay, so as long as we're not being controlled by them, yeah, Uh uh-huh.
Right. So Jesus ate with the tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, but Jesus didn't become a sinner, right? Um, so there's, there's something there, but you kind of see it's like, yes, but no. You know, he doesn't become like them, but he does have them as companions. Yeah. Um, so I think it is okay to have words with friends. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's kind of similar. It's kind of like Jesus going to the, to the uh, tax collectors and sinners. It's not, I'm going to stay away. Uh, even you might say, how can we be salt of the earth and light to the world if we don't have anybody that we're close to? But at the same time, there's always that, am I influencing them or are they influencing me? Yeah. Right, right. Do you have your hand up? No, okay. You're up. Um, I, I mean, you just talked to prostitutes, so mm-hmm. I think it's about the mindset that you um, talk to, to your friends with. Like, just be aware of, like, okay, I might be tempted to explain this, so just being constantly aware. And that's obviously the mindset you should approach it. I mean, all my brothers and sisters, it's like, if you're reading the article, and you're like, I need to just be aware of mm-hmm. what, what the world is trying to throw you on. Right. So constant awareness, this is something that's coming from people who don't have my perspective. And so I have to be aware of that, but it doesn't mean I can't have anything to do with it. I just have to be able to not be unduly influenced by it, right? So that's friends. That's also media stuff too, okay? Yes? Right, right. That's good. Comparing it to where I've been, am I doing things, talking in different ways? You guys know that you talk like your friends, right? Whoever your friends are, you get in that group and you start talking like them. Um, how am I talking? What am I thinking about? What are we doing? Um, even, even just something as simple as like, I'm in a group text with these guys and they're all talking like this and they're all talking about this. And then I'm, I find myself in a month or two kind of joining in and telling the same jokes and, you know, it becomes, I'm becoming like them. Another thing on that, if you're not sure who's influencing who, ask somebody who's not with that person. Hey, have you noticed a change in me? Maybe that's your parents. Maybe that's somebody who's a, another friend who's not in that group or not with, you know, not connected with this person. Uh, but to be aware, you need something objective. Because you might not notice how you're changing as you deal with these friends. Yes? Well, with how you manage your friends, I would think, well, I normally kind of like to compare it to how you have been or find someone who's kind of talking about it. But also, I think, is this person trying to ask me to work with my boundaries? Are mm-hmm. they trying to push me or right. are they? Which influence is winning? Yep. Do you have something? You, you see, you find yourself doing something I, I didn't want to do or I didn't think was right. And, well, how did I get here? Then you start to see, oh, suddenly there's clarity about what's happened and who's influencing who. Um, similarly, 
Should we watch bad movies, listen to bad music, look at bad things online? Like, you guys know, like, the, the, the textbook answer is no, don't do that. No, don't do that. But you also know what it's like online. If you just say no to that question, you might as well just throw your phone away. Like, there's nothing online that's going to be completely not any of those things, or very little. So I want you to think about, and we don't have to answer this because we're running short on time, and I've got a little more I want to cover. Um, I, I want you to think about your life. I am not up here because I feel like I need to tell you what to do. Those passages that we read, the principles that we're talking about, they are the way people leave Jesus. That's how it happens. Whether you decide you want to accept that or not, that's what happens. I am here to say you need to think about your life and you need to think about your habits and your influences because you're not neutral. You're being led somewhere. And so I'm not here to say, hey, don't ever have bad friends or if you ever look at anything bad online, that's the worst. I'm here to say be aware, like we've talked about, be aware that this is the reality of life. Uh, we asked, we kind of talked about that question. Um, okay, I want to briefly talk about this and, uh, and we'll move on. We've got, we've got really two more topics that I want to, I want to cover. I want you to think about one of the things that when I put my surveys up here on Tuesday, it said that one of the major issues in people falling away was that they did not have connection to a church or connection with other Christians. And especially as you transition from home to adulthood, whatever form that takes for you, college, workplace, moving away, whatever it is, it's challenging to connect with other people who are good influences, with brothers and sisters in Christ. It's challenging because you are in a new place. Usually you're young, you know, you may be 18, you may be 21, and you go to a church and you look around and a lot of the people are older. And so, you know, you don't relate to them and don't connect with them. And then maybe you talk with some people and you don't connect easily. Like they don't have your interest. Or maybe they don't talk like you do and you're with them and you just kind of feel ill at ease. Or maybe it's that you don't want to go to church that much. And so when you do show up, people are like, where have you been? We want to see you more. And you feel judged by them. Or you feel criticized by them. One way or another, this transition, this handoff from home to a, a new place where you are in place as an adult is really hard. So I just want you to think about this for a minute. I... I I do think that it can be really challenging to build connections with other Christians. And let me tell you why. I think it's hard because we don't usually pick friends this way. When we pick friends, we pick friends because we like that person, we have the same interests, we like the same jokes, we talk the same way. That's why we pick friends, right? And we feel like we don't belong with people that we don't have that connection with. But Christians are not like that. We don't go to church with other people and call each other brother and sister because we all like the same things and laugh at the same jokes. That's not what makes a church a church. There is one thing that connects you with other Christians. If you are a Christian, it is because you believe in Jesus and because other people believe in Jesus that you are now brothers and sisters in Christ. There's nothing else. And if you're looking for that, if you're looking for friends that are going to share all your interests, you're probably going to be frustrated with the church because the church is not the place where we all have the same worldly interests. I, uh, I was 22 years old when I started preaching. And I moved to this very, very small town in East Texas. And there was one other couple there that was even remotely close to my age. And it was a lonely, hard transition for me and my wife. We, we had a hard time. And within about a year, we realized what had happened was we had started to make friends with people who were in their 70s. And we would hang out with these people. I had nothing in common with them, okay? Nothing. I, I, I would describe it to you if I could adequately put how different we were. Uh, but they were the people that I hung out with. They were the people that I would 
sit in their house and talk to them. We'd have them over for dinner and they'd have us over for dinner. They became friends. Our education was different. Our interests were different. Yet we are friends because we believe in Jesus. That was the only thing. It made me realize I've been doing this all wrong. And so I want to remind you that when you get to the descriptions of the church in the New Testament, they are people who don't know each other and have nothing in common except Jesus. And it says of them, like in Acts 4.32, uh, Acts 4.34, it says they were of one heart and one soul. How did they get there? They weren't all from the same places. They didn't even all speak the same language. They didn't have the same background. How did they get there? It was just because they believed in Jesus. So I want to encourage you, don't be so shallow as to think that you can only be friends with people who are exactly like you. And that the goal of your relationships is to find a bunch of people who are clones of you. Because if you do that, what you'll end up doing is rejecting people that you have the most important thing in common with. People who believe in Jesus and have your perspective on life. So I want you to think about that as you look toward transitioning away from home. All right, I want to talk a little about dating and sex. I mentioned Solomon's wives turned away his heart after other gods. And I want to tell you a story that I have seen repeated in different people over and over and over again. Two people start dating. Usually one of them is a Christian and one is not. And so the Christian starts dating this person. Usually they think they're attractive. They think they're a nice person. And uh, first date goes well. Second date goes well. And they think, you know what? We probably need to talk about spiritual things, but we'll do that later. I mean, it would be awkward if we did that on the first date. And then they felt like I was trying to convert them on the first date. So we wait. We wait. And so usually a month or two goes by. You know, they start to get to know each other. Uh, start to have their own little inside jokes. They're hanging out all the time, you know, and they, they start being very drawn to each other, attracted to each other. At some point, one of them invites the other home for Thanksgiving or for Christmas, and they meet the parents. And you say, wow, this is getting serious, you know. And, and so maybe someone says, hey, are they a Christian? And the Christian says, uh, no, but, but she seems open. Or I'm hopeful that he'll come. And maybe once or twice, they'll invite him to church. And they'll come to church, but they don't really talk much about it. They just kind of come and then leave and say, well, we did, we did what we were supposed to do. And then pretty soon it becomes so serious that he's out buying a ring. And they're talking about the future. And, you know, they're making plans. Where are we going to live? What's your job? You know, how are we going to make two lives into one? We start talking about the future. And there is this nagging sense, you know what, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about the disconnection spiritually that we have. But by this point, they're in love. And so finally, one of them broaches the topic with the other. And usually there will be some initial interest. But at some point, there's just the idea, look, I don't believe like you. And I'm not going to change. And so we put it off a little bit. We put it off. And then by this point, we're engaged to be married. And so when you're engaged to be married, you guys haven't lived through this yet. But it's all about invitations and wedding venues and flowers and family and we're not really thinking about that but you know someone at some point usually it's me I come into the story at this point because they come to me for premarital counseling and they say hey preacher counsel us so that we're ready to be married and I talk to them and I realize one of them is not even a Christian and so I'll say well let's study about that and eventually it's just kind of a no not interested and usually, the way that story ends is they go on and get married. And within a year, you don't see either one of them again. They're done. Because just like what happened with Solomon, heart has been turned away. What was a passion now becomes a passion for the person. This is how relationships work. I want you to think about that that the people we date and marry affect our relationship with Jesus. And I want you to think about how that might feel if you felt like you had to choose between Jesus and the person you love. And the wisdom here may be, I don't want to get so far that I fall in love with a person without ever resolving our spiritual incompatibility. That this matters to me 
And I want it to matter to the person I'm going to care about. I'm not saying that it's somehow a sin to date a non-Christian. I'm saying we are foolish if we discount the impact that person can have on us. It happened to Solomon. It can happen today. I have seen it happen more times than I could count for you today. I want you to think about why that happens. Why do Christians date people who are bad spiritual influences on them? Why do they do that? I don't want you to answer because we don't have any time. Usually we date people that are bad spiritual influences because we're not thinking about that. If you're superficial, it's because you think, oh, she's really hot. I'm not worried about any of that. Maybe it's that I really like this person. They pay attention to me. I could see myself with them for the future. And I want you to know that can include other Christians. Christians who are not spiritually minded, who are not going to lead me in the right way. And yet, I'm drawn to them for other reasons than our spiritual compatibility. That can have an impact on your spiritual life. And I want you to think, we didn't have time to really talk much about sex. But usually that also involves a pressure to sex and sexual immorality. Basically, having sex before you get married. And sex becoming a part of the equation of what leads you in one direction or the other. I want you to think about this. Because young people don't decide to have sex for no reason. That is a temptation that has a strong pull. And I want you to think about why that would be. Why am I so tempted to to do this and to do this with this person? Especially the relational part where one person that you care about is pressuring you to do something that you don't believe is right, and yet, like we've talked about, you end up doing something and you realize, I never thought I would do this. But it is a relationship issue where people move us in a direction. All right, so, look guys, we're out of time. I wanna tell you, I have appreciated so much you guys talking to me this week. I want you to know that it is possible to build a faith that will last through everything that's ahead of you. And I want to challenge you to do that for yourself. I want to challenge you that it is not enough to simply say, yes, I believe in Jesus, and then to just falter whenever anything difficult happens. I want to encourage you to make wise choices with your life and to have a faith that lasts. Thank you so much, guys, and I appreciate it.